Good morning, church. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you here this morning. Uh, let me read a couple of verses from Psalms chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Uh, join with me in prayer this morning. Uh, Lord, we sing praise to your name, and, and, and we tell all the world of your marvelous works this morning, Lord. I, whoever hears this message and wherever it goes, Lord, we, I pray that, um, that everyone who hears this would know that you are the Lord, and, and you are worthy to be praised. Uh, and that's what we do this morning in our gathering together, whether it's online, in person, whatever it might be, Lord, we praise your name, and we shout to the world of your marvelous works. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time that we have together this morning, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, again, good morning, church. Obviously, we're not together as we hoped we would be uh, this Sunday. Uh, we were planning on having a, an outdoor uh, modified service, something that we could just spend some time together, maybe spend some time in worship. Uh, for, for some different reasons, we decided to postpone that. Uh, but we are looking for a week from today. We're, we're again going to uh, consider that. We're going to look at some different things. Uh, we would love to be together uh, next Sunday, which will be the first Sunday in May. Uh, at least give us an opportunity to, uh, to maybe have communion together, um, again, in a modified uh, format and, and, and respecting uh, any boundaries that we need to for safety as well as uh, adhering to local guidelines. So so continue to look for that, look for messages throughout the week, emails, look, in, look on Facebook so we can continue to share those updates with you. Uh, we'll get that information out to you as we make those decisions. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to clarify from last Sunday before I get to a message that I have for you uh, this morning. Uh, last Sunday, I, I, I showed you uh, my kids. You haven't seen them in a while, so I had Cameron and Hallie on. And I told you that Cameron uh, had graduated from college and he was married with two children. Uh, afterwards, Cameron came to me and he said, Dad, do they know that you're joking? And I thought, you know, at first I just brushed it off like, yes, Cameron, anyone that knows me knows that I was joking. But then I thought, he may be concerned that any eligible bachelorettes out there think that he's off the market. So I, I wanted to clarify that Cameron is not married. That was a joke. Um, he's, he's still eligible and available uh, for any young women out there that might be looking. So I just wanted to clarify that. And, and hopefully uh, my son will appreciate this. He probably won't, but uh, hopefully he'll appreciate that I clarified that. Um, I wanted to just talk to you a message on my heart this morning and one thing that's for sure is I, I'm really <laughs> I'm really not sure who's hearing these messages who's watching them I don't know uh, I, I think in some sense there's some people that aren't normally in church that are that are seeing and hearing uh, not, not just messages from me but all, all churches that are online right now and and so that's a good thing um, but it's a little bit tough I'll tell you as a pastor uh, not knowing who's hearing or what's being heard. Uh, I don't know if you'll stick with this. I don't know how long before you're uh, before you scroll to something else in your Facebook feed. Maybe uh, by now you're already gone. Uh, if that's the case, I understand. I do have a message on my heart this morning, um, particularly some things that I want to share at the end to challenge the church. And and so if you're still here when I get to that part, I'm glad. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm glad that you stuck around with us. Um, maybe it's not for you, and so and, and I understand if you if you go on to something else. But uh, but I pray that whoever does stick around to hear this message today, that the Lord will use it, and that you will understand uh, where I'm coming from, and understand my heart on a few of these things. Uh, I can tell you that since the beginning of this pandemic, um, there have been a couple things that really haven't changed for me. Uh, the first is that I know that there are a lot of questions and a lot of things that I just I'm uncertain of, uh, from a political standpoint, from a from a government standpoint, from a, a medical standpoint, scientifically, um, there are a lot of things that I just don't understand that are going on right now. I saw a, a funny and, and yet somewhat true uh, video on social media uh, just earlier this week. Excuse me. I saw uh, this video where uh, a woman was explaining all of the different restrictions and all of the different things that we need to do 
in regard to this pandemic and 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 you know I, I would have to say i agree with her i've heard all of these different things from experts that seem to be qualified uh you know stay home unless you have to go out and then go out stores should be closed unless they need to be open and then they should be open uh we should stay so far apart from each other but uh you know you know we should we should wear masks but not wear masks we should wear gloves but not wear it, it's it's somewhat confusing to me and, and from the beginning i i can admit that i haven't understood all of these things things. And, uh, and, and I think now is no different. After um, several weeks of this, I, I would say it's, it's still that way. I'm still confused uh, by some of the different things that are going on and the different responses. And, and uh, if you've been to, say, Lowe's recently, which I was just recently, and uh, Lowe's was as packed as I've ever seen it. Um, and, and so uh, why, why is that okay or reasonable? And yet some other things that we've shut down aren't reasonable. There, there's a lot here I don't understand. Uh, forget being at Lowe's, just, just within the last 48 hours, I saw that there was one state um, that's preparing to, to reopen, to, to kind of go back to business as normal, uh, and, and yet another state at the same time extended their stay-at-home order through the end of the month of May. Uh, so as I see these different things, and, and everyone has their reasonings for doing what they're doing, and, and, and experts are saying competing in different things it, it, it has been confusing for me i don't know if you're like me at all in that sense but i can admit to you that there are a lot of things here that i don't understand throughout this whole deal i can also tell you that from the beginning i have believed that the church has and will have an opportunity to have a great impact uh, on this nation, on our communities. I, I, I believe that we'll have an opportunity to reach people that we don't normally reach. And, and, and as I said, I don't know who's seeing this message, but I have gotten some feedback from, from some people that aren't normally in church at, that have been watching some of these messages. And, and so hopefully that's a, a good thing. And I, I will tell you, that I, I still believe now, several weeks into this, I still believe that we as a church will have an opportunity to reach many people through this time and to have a great impact on our, on our nation, on our, on our communities, on our states. We will have an opportunity to have a great impact. Uh, but I have to tell you that the impact that we have is really going to depend on how we respond at this point. Um, I, I think how we responded the first week was important, uh, but in some ways we hadn't really reached, uh, the, 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 we hadn't really reached the, uh, the important point of this whole thing. When this started, uh, spring break was coming and many people were planning to be out of school and, and doing different things anyways. So at that point it felt different. It wasn't a normal spring break, but it was still a little bit keeping with the normal routine of the year. The kids were expected to not be in school during that time. But here we are now, we're, we're, we're a few weeks past that, and the kids have returned to a modified school and, and doing e-learning, and, and we're responsible for some of that here at home. And and, and different things have gone further. We're further into shutdown of businesses. And, 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 and it's at this point that I really think that, that we as a church have an opportunity to have an impact. It's, it's how we respond from here forward as it gets tougher, as, as things um, go deeper into this, um, to our response as a nation, as community. It's now that our response as a church, I think, is going to be closely watched. And how we respond now as things are getting tougher, uh, that will really give us the opportunity to have the impact that I believe that we will have. And I think if you're watching any news and, and things going on in our nation, you're, you're seeing this. As, as people are starting to protest about opening up businesses and opening up churches and, 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 and protesting about certain rights and liberties that have been taken away, I think it's during this time where we as a church will have the opportunity to have the greatest impact. How we respond as Christians right now, uh, not how we responded two days in or a week in, but how we respond five weeks in, six weeks in, I think this is where the greatest opportunity lies for us. And, and as this conversation is going on across our nation, uh, there are some there are some different areas that have really spoken to me over the last week that I want to try to address here this morning. Uh, one of those uh, areas is is the 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 boundary between excuse me the boundary between uh, personal individual freedoms and the greater good, and 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 where does that boundary meet, and and how are we as Christians responsible for that boundary? 
Now, one of the things that's frustrating for me is when I hear people in the media, uh, people that I know, friends that I have, and, and, and they will oftentimes, when, when their agenda doesn't seem to align with, with whatever the agenda is, might be from a, from a political standpoint, uh, sometimes uh, the name of Jesus is invoked. What would Jesus think of this? What would Jesus think of people wanting to go back to work? Uh, and, and putting lives at risk. What would Jesus do? And, and, and that bothers me coming from people who really don't know who Jesus is and don't acknowledge who Jesus is. And oftentimes they will have a limited understanding of Scripture and they'll take that Scripture and, and they'll use it out of context or they'll use a small portion of Scripture to say, wouldn't Jesus be upset about this? And, and, and so that, that bothers me because we in the church... We should be able to have a full understanding of the context of all of these different situations, but always keeping an eye on the biblical view. And so we hear different uh, we hear different um, points of view from politics, and we hear different points of view from science. We hear different points of views of medicine, but those people in those different arenas, particularly those who are not Christians, shouldn't be telling us what Jesus thinks. We should, for ourselves, be looking to his word and asking, okay, what does Jesus say, and what does scripture say about this? I, I hear different cries about personal liberties and personal freedoms. And, and I think if we really take them, we could apply them across the board. Uh, for example, for the greater good, we should give up personal li liberties and stay home to protect those who are most at risk and to protect our health care workers. I, I completely understand that and I completely agree with that. But you could just as easily say, for the greater good, we need to go back to work so that our economy doesn't plunge into a great recession uh, that will impact the entire world, uh, that will push people that are in poverty further into poverty, uh, that will ultimately, because of the, uh, the depths of this recession that could be coming, uh, could cost people their lives as well. And so we should, for the greater good, go back to work. So I hear these discussions about greater good versus personal liberty, and I just want to give you from Scripture a couple of things that we can look at, and really two things that I want to consider. The first today is how do we as Christians respond? And, and as I'm telling you here, and there's churches and pastors responding in different ways, this is what's on my heart this morning and what I want to share with you. How do we as Christians respond and how do we balance individual liberties and, and, and kind of the greater good, um, everything that's going on around us? Uh, the first thing I would say is this. Uh, we are not individuals uh, that act solely in our own best interest. Uh, as Christians, we know that we are called to make sacrifices for those around us. So it, we cannot look at life and say, hey, I'm just going to do whatever is in my best interest at the time. Uh, so we, we know that we are not individualistic by nature. Um, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verses 20 through, 24 through 26 uh, then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit, it, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So as Christians, we know that we don't act in our, solely in our own best interest. Uh, when others are, are hoarding things, uh, we're giving away. Uh, when others are worrying only about themselves, we're looking for ways that we can care for and take care of the needs of others. Uh, so, so in a society where typically, a, a, as Americans, uh, we do have more of an individualistic approach where we have individual freedoms and rights, but as Christians, we know uh, that for us to act solely in our own best interest is to go against teaching in Scripture that tells us if we want to gain our life, we're going to lose it. Uh, we're going to sacrifice our own life uh, to love and serve others. Now, sometimes, and in a time like this, maybe we can become frustrated because there are so many people that need help, and there are so many things around us. How can we possibly, uh, how can we possibly do everything that needs to be done? Uh, something I want to encourage you right now is this. Uh, maybe it's just one that you need to care for. Uh, don't consider the needs of, of, of the whole world and everything that's going on, but maybe it's just one person that the Lord has brought in your path that you need to care for. 
Uh, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is talking about dividing the sheep from the goats. And, and he says here in verses 37 through 40, it says, Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So today, church, as we consider the world around us and everything that's going on, and, and we're called by Scripture to, to lay down our lives and to make sacrifices for others, maybe it's just for one. Is there one that God has brought to your mind and to your heart this week? Is there one that you're called to love for? Is there one that you're called to care for? Is there one that you're called to reach out to? Um, maybe it's just that one this week. So don't be overwhelmed or overburdened with everything that's going on in the world around us, but do be sensitive to what God's leading in your life. And maybe he's calling you right now just to love one person. So first of all, how do we respond? We know that we don't act solely for our own good. We're not individualistic by nature as Christians, but we also know, we also know that we are not members of a group that acts solely in the interest of the group. And, and, and you might say, well, well, what group? And my response is, it, it doesn't really matter. It, let's, let's start with the church, just to be fair. Um, as Christians, I know this. I don't mindlessly follow a church. I follow Jesus Christ. So if I'm at a church that, that stops preaching the Word of God, that's, that's teaching things that go against the Word of God, I don't just follow that group. I can turn and say, you know what, this, this, this church is now coming between me and the truth of Scripture, coming between me and my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So in that sense, I can be more individualistic. I can say, I don't act solely in my own benefit, but I also uh, don't just collectively follow a group with, without any regards to what Scripture says. And that group could be a church, it could be a nation, it could be a political party, it could be a family. Hey, family is important to all of us. But if, if my family is going a, a certain direction that goes against the Word of God, uh, then I, as an as a individual, can say, you know what, I don't align with my family in that thinking or in that uh, belief. Uh, so we as Christians, we are not solely individualistic, but we don't also just collectively follow a group and, and do whatever that group wants for the greater good of that group. Uh, Paul says this in Romans chapter 3. He says, let God be true and every man a liar. Now, now sometimes this, this can be seem or sound offensive, but, but uh, when we take it to understand this, what Paul's saying is, if every man says one thing, but it goes against God's word, it's God that is true in every man that's a liar. So as a Christian, I can look to the world around me and say, even though everyone else, else is saying, hey, this is for the greater good, even though everyone else is saying, this is the way we should go, if it goes against scripture, I'm not going to follow that way. Let God be true. Let every man a liar. I'm going to stand with God and I'm going to stand with his word. I'm not going to just follow the group because the group says this is where we should go. Now we know as Christians because of that, we know that there are times where we will be walking on a path uh, that few are walking with us. Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14, and Jesus says this, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So we know sometimes as Christians, uh, we're going to find ourselves on a narrow path, and there's not going to be as many with us. Uh, uh, people, for whatever reason, are going a certain direction, uh, but the word, of, the word of God has called us out to be different, to be separated. And, and so sometimes we're going to find ourselves in that position. So we're not individualistic by nature where um, we just act solely in our own benefit, uh, but we're also not collectivists where we act always for the greater good. Uh, so what are we and, and how do we respond? Um, I, I think first and foremost, we are children of God and we act in the best interest of his kingdom. Uh, we love and serve and give not for our own benefit, 
uh, if you take the church, I, I, I love I love our church and, and I love serving our church and I love giving to our church, but I don't do it for my own benefit, even though scripture tells me that I will be, uh, that it will uh, benefit me. I will be blessed uh, by, by the church. I will be blessed by serving the church. I will be blessed by giving to the church, but that's not why I do it. And, and, and I love and I serve the church and I give to the church, not for the church's benefit. So it's not for my benefit as an individual and it's not for the, the benefit of the, of the group. Now, will it benefit the group? Yes, but that's not why we do it. We love and serve the church uh, because it is God's church and he's ordained it. And we serve the church for the glory of God and for his kingdom. So it's not, first of all, for the benefit of the individual and it's not for the benefit of the group itself. It's for the glory of God and it's to serve his kingdom. So we are children of God. And we know that we need to be mindful first and foremost of the things of God, not the things of man, not for my own individual needs, and not even for the collective good of the group. I am first and foremost focused on God, His kingdom, and His glory. In Matthew chapter 16, I read you a couple of verses earlier from Matthew chapter 16. If we go back a couple of verses before the ones I read to you earlier to verses 21 through 23, it says this, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So when we look out solely for our own interests, we're being mindful of the things of men. When we follow the group and, and, and when we only look to the greater good of the group, regardless of what it does or says about the word of God, we're being mindful of the things of men. As Christians, we are called to be more, first and foremost, we are called to be uh, mindful of the things of God. That's our primary responsibility. And sometimes that's going to mean sacrificing ourselves, and sometimes that's going to mean turning away from the group. But we are first and foremost mindful of the things of God. So that's our response. Uh, our primary response and our primary concern through, through anything that's going on is to be mindful of the things of God. Now, the, the second thing that I want to address today is, is, is how does God care for us? So if, if I'm looking towards God, and I'm not mindful of my own concerns, and I'm not mindful of the, of, the, of the greater good going on around me, well, how is God going to care for us? Is God able to balance my needs and the needs of the greater good? I, I think He is. Let me just show you a couple things. We know that in Scripture, God always puts value on the individual. So as I lay down my life, to serve God and to glorify his kingdom, I know that he values me. In Luke chapter 15, there are a couple of parables right at the beginning of chapter 15 that, that illustrate this. Uh, one is the parable of the lost sheep and one is the, uh, the parable of the lost coin. In the parable of the lost sheep, in, in Luke chapter 15, verse 4, it says this, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? So we never have to wor worry as individuals that God doesn't value us. God always values the individual. It says here that he's going to leave the ninety-nine for the one. So we can know, as, as Christians, we can know when we sacrifice those things that might seem to be in our best interest, that God's going to care for us and He's going to love us. We can also know that God can be trusted to balance my individual needs with the collective good in a way that I'm probably not able to do it. I, I'm probably, because of my nature, I, I'm going to tend towards my own needs first. And God's going to value me as an individual, but he's also going to, he's also going to value the collective good. I, I think the best way to show this, or one of the best ways in Scripture, is to consider the, the, the structure of the church, the body of Christ. And when we talk about gifts and purposes, we know uh, we, that we use that image of a body. And, and the church is made up of many parts, one body. Now, the body is not the body without the thumb, without the hand, without the ear, without the eye. All of these parts making up the body, and that's individuals. That's who we are as individuals. We are important, and we make up the body of Christ. 
but it's the church in its, of itself has its greatest purpose and has its greatest influence and its greatest effect when we are together as one, the collective good. So, so God can both uh, watch out for us as individuals, uh, uh, give us everything that we need and take care of us, but also put us into something greater, into a group, into a, a, the collective good that makes the that has the greatest impact on the world, and He can do that in a way. Uh, that doesn't infringe upon or take away from who we are as individuals. Another example, of course, of, of God looking out for the collective good is, is simply his son Jesus on the cross. In John chapter 11, we studied this um, uh, last year in John chapter 11, verses 49 through 52. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, on his own authority but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So Jesus making the ultimate individual sacrifice for the greater good, giving his life and dying on the cross that we should not perish. One man sacrificing that the whole nation, that the whole world would not have to perish. What a great example of our God looking out for the collective good. So we know that God always values the individual and he's always looking out for the collective good as well. And we can trust him in this. Now, I want to close with a word here of challenge to the church. As I said, I think that it's right now at this point when things are starting to get tough that our impact as a church has the greatest opportunity. Now, as we go and we see some protests and we see some 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 people um, uh, upset about what seems to be maybe personal liberties and, and, and even religious liberties and freedoms that, that could be under attack, I would like for us to consider something else before we get too far into this. Um, I, I, throughout this pandemic, from the very beginning, I have seen the verses 2 Chronicles 7.13, particularly 7.13, and of course then 7.14 uh, from 2 Chronicles. I have seen these verses uh, so many times, and, and, and I want to admit that if, if you share that on your Facebook status or wherever it might be in social media, when someone shares that verse or... or, or um, says, hey, we need to look at this verse. I don't always know what their heart is in sharing that verse. So, so I'm making no judgments here. But every time I've seen that verse from the beginning of this pandemic, it's, it's bothered me a little bit. And, and I can tell you why. I, I get this sense that there's somewhat of a, 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 a feeling in the church that God has sent this pandemic because of the problems he has with our nation. Now, when I read 2 Chronicles 7, 13, it says this, When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. So that's what 7, 13 says. And, and people have referenced, um, there's no rain in Australia. This is what's going on. And, and there's been locusts over here. And now, now there's this pandemic. This pestilence has come. This is exactly what's happening. And, 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 I, and I get this feeling that we're looking to the world around us and saying, hey, God is upset with the world, and so he has sent this. Now, depending on your view of God, you may or may not agree with that, but I want to challenge you. If God has sent this, I want us to at least ask why. And it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 13, he says, or send pestilence among my people. And then 14 goes on to say this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Christians, church, CCC, before we begin to protest the government and before we begin to cry out about liberties and freedoms that have been taken so taken away i would le least like to consider what these verses say now if god did send this and we may not agree on that but if god did send this why did he send it and to whom did he send it because second chronicles 7 13 and 14 says he sent it to his people and it says in 7 14 
It says, when my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. It doesn't say that God sent these things because he was upset with a government. It doesn't say he sent these things because he was upset with policies from those people who don't know him. It says he was upset with the people who call, who, who are called by his name. So if we as Christians are going to look at these verses, we must at least consider that if this was sent by God, it was sent because God is turning to his people, those that are called by his name, and he is asking us to humble ourselves, to turn from our wicked ways. And then he says, if, if we will do that, he'll forgive our sin and he'll heal, heal our land. Back at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, when I was talking about how we will respond as Christians and how we will respond as a church, one of the things that I brought to your attention, and I want to remind you of it today, is Romans chapter 13 that says this. Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that, are, that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. I guess I'm wondering this. If we're at a point where, we're, where we are ready to resist the government and say, hey, we're going to go to our church no matter what, you can't take away my personal freedoms. At least according to this scripture, are we resisting the hand of God? If we are to look at this and say, and God says in Romans chapter 13, through Paul, he says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. I have to at least wonder, and taking from 2 Chronicles 7, 13, if the doors of the church have been shut, were they shut by the government or were they shut by the hand of God? And before we start protesting and before we start um, planning demonstrations and acting in defiance of the government, I would at least like for us to consider that maybe, just maybe, it was God that shut the church, not the government. And the reason I would ask, that, ask for us to consider is this. Before our churches open back up, who are we and what are we to be? And if God did shut the door of the church, why? I will read to you one more verse, or a couple more verses, and then I'll close. Malachi chapter 1, 10 and 11 says this, Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. I just wonder if God shut the doors of the church because he was fed up with the vain offerings that were being offered in his church. I'm wondering if, if God is calling us to a place right now where he's saying, my name is not great among the nations, and it's not great not because of what's coming out of governments and not because of what's coming out of nations and not because of what's coming out of the world. My name is not great right now because of what's coming out of my church. And so maybe the doors of the church have been shut for us to, to protect us so we'll stop making offerings in vain before God. I think I just want to challenge this church because there's no place I want to be more than in the church making an offering of praise with you. But before those doors open back up, I think it's time for us, and before we go onto the picket lines and before we start to act in defiance of the government, I think it's time for us as Christians to go into our, into our closets and into our bedrooms and shut the doors by ourselves and get down on our knees and say, God, forgive us. Forgive us for mocking your name. What's, make, what's made the name of God mocked among the nations is not what's coming out of the government. It's what's coming out of the church. Our stance on so many issues, our, our, our defiance of God's word on so many things, ignoring who God is, ignoring his place in our lives, I believe has led his name to be mocked among the nations. But God says, my name will not be mocked. My name will be great among the nations. So if a pestilence was set, and if the government is acting and closing, we, we know this, Scripture by Scripture says this, that the, that the government authority is the authority given by God. 
And so if the government closed the doors, we can at least consider and make the very much make the case through Scripture that the that it wasn't the government that shut the doors of the church, that it was by God's hand that the doors of the church have been shut. And if that's the case, why? And what are we going to do with this time? I believe we have such an opportunity to, to reach the world around us for Christ. But if we miss this opportunity, if we look at this time and look and blame the government for the doors of the church being closed, I think we're missing an opportunity. We're missing an opportunity to, to get down and to, to get down on our knees and to get down on our face and humble ourselves and ask the Lord to heal us and forgive our lands and to turn from our wicked ways and to return to Him and return to His Word. And that's who we are as a church and that's who we need to be. I want to be together. I want to open the doors. I hope we're together as soon as next Sunday. But let's not miss this opportunity. Let's not get so caught up in pointing fingers and blaming the government and blaming uh, the medical world and blaming corporations and saying our rights and freedoms are being taken away. Let's look to God and to his word and saying, God, if, if you've done this, why? And how are we going to respond? And how are we going to change through this to be the church that you desire us to be? I pray that if you're still with me at this point in the message, I pray that you will that you will hear uh, my heart in this and that you will receive this word from God. And, and, it, and maybe you've already done this during this time. Maybe you've already taken some time of personal reflection. If you have not, I pray that you would. I pray that you would take some time in silence. Take some time with yourself, just you and the Lord, and ask Him to search your heart and to show you anything anything that needs to be repented of in your life. And I pray that we as a church would do that as well. And we would say, Lord, we don't want to open our doors and be what we've always been. We want to be your church. I thank you for gathering with me to the, today and, and this morning. I thank you for listening to this message. I pray that you would be blessed this week. And I pray that as we move forward, and I, and I admit I don't have all the answers and I don't know all the responses, but I pray that we would be mindful of the things of God through this. Not, not just our own needs and not just the needs of the world around us, but that we would be mindful of the things of God and we would seek to glorify His kingdom in everything we do.